Thank you, dear heart, and welcome, everybody. Delighted that you're here. Delighted to have this opportunity to uh, move the conversation forward. Of course, our conversation the last couple of days has been about responsibility communication. Uh, are you using words to describe the constructs of your mind as constructs of your mind uh, or as facts in the world? I mean, virtually everybody in the, in the culture uses words to describe the constructs of their mind as though that construct is what they're looking at, which it is what they're looking at, but it's not on the outside of their eyeballs. It's painted on the inside of their eyeballs. And, you know, pretty much nobody knows that. So what we're inviting people to do with their words is to begin to use words to accurately describe what's going on in your life. That is that when you describe something that you think you see that's out there, that you recognize that it is a perceptual construct of your mind and belongs to you, rather than trying to use words to prove that it's true about somebody else. If you'd like more information on that, there's a really excellent TED Talk by a gentleman named Anil, A-N-I-L, Seth, S-E-T-H. If you go on YouTube and search Anil Seth TED Talk, Anil is a neuroscientist, and he explains the fact that eyes don't see. That's the bottom line of it, that what sees is our brain, and that what our brain is showing us, again, and I use it metaphorically as it painted on the inside of our eyeballs, isn't out there at all. And you find that uh, the game, the whole game of life changes when you start to use words to actually communicate rather than convince, win, manipulate, control, get what you want. So it's a, a fun tool. It's an interesting tool to learn. I wonder if uh, Magda happens to be out there today, Jeannie. I actually just thought I should have sent her a text to see if she'd come on and play a little bit and uh, perhaps share with us her insight from the intensive where she agreed to be the she, she agreed to carry out the practicum with Chuck, and uh, it opened some great insights for her. So i just putting a, an invitation out there, Mung, if you happen to be on the line. That she you is there. I'm going to turn on her microphone, and we'll see if she's available to talk. Hello, Magda. Hey, Magda, are you there, and, young lady? Well, her, I attempted to turn on her microphone and it's spinning so oh there okay Magda are you with us are you out there Magda hello Magdalena okay well she may be busy at something else or may not want to uh, step into the conversation at this point I just had the thought that she might be willing to share I should have checked with her before the show uh, that she might be willing to share some of the insights that she got that led to uh, um, the communication uh, practical aspect of that intensive becoming really just so powerful. And, of course, the uh, that intensive is a part of the self-study of codependence to interdependence that we have available. If anyone wants to take your work to the next level, the uh, intensive covers... Actually, it covers two full intensives, which we recorded on Zoom, of course, with everybody's knowledge and permission. And it includes 90 hours of instruction, of questions and answers, of process work. We do, why is this happening to me again? Healing through relationships, codependence to interdependence, and communication. Did you hear what I think I said? Mind shifters and still point breathing are all part of that intensive. And that's available for purchase. Fairly nominal price for 90 hours of really deep, pretty intense work. It's a powerful happening to take that on as a self-study. And the cost of the whole package, including a pre and post personal code online personal code evaluation and a total fresh and raw food program, through our private Facebook page. So it's a, it's a really, um, hmm, as I say, 
powerful package and, if you want to step forward. If you want to look from a Trello perspective. Oh yes, and then there's a Trello app with all the uh, uh, recipes in them. That's right. Yes. So if you want to move forward in terms of your mental, emotional, spiritual, physiological nutrition, then there's a whole package of material available. If you're interested in doing it, you can drop Jeannie a note, J-E-A-N-I-E at W-H-Y, again, dot org. The uh, communication part was very powerful in, in the second intensive, which is the one where Magda agreed to, with Chuck, do the uh, responsibility communication process. So much fun to watch it unfold, and deep appreciation for for Magda for the uh, courage he had to step up and go for it, and really open the space for some just powerful, wonderful conversation. Much appreciation there, and of course, codependence. It was interesting. I was talking to someone uh, recently. And she's been kind of mentioning this process this person's been going through. And someone who's been involved with the work for about 30 years, but it's kind of a stage where it appears it's like, oh, I don't need to do worksheets. Uh, I'll just kind of slide along. And uh, recently came across uh, a really deep level, deep-seated, Uncovering that created created quite a a ripple in his field, so to speak. And he called and asked for support, and I was there. And and, uh, probably one of the biggest issues in this gentleman's life. And a couple days after we had that conversation, he sent me a link to someone who's talking about how well all you have to do is have unconditional love and just kind of you know, went through a whole routine about, well, in essence, there's really not much you can do about it. And I asked him if he was doing worksheets these days, and he said no. So I put that invitation out. And this morning, I was guided to, you know, when I, my waking time is usually when I get important pieces of information and I was glad to send him a quote from Carl Jung. If you're not familiar with Carl Jung, you, he's probably one of the most uh, highly respected and highly thought of psychiatrists the world's ever seen. And he said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Making the darkness conscious. There's another spot where Jung talks about how the unconscious dynamics that we refuse to deal with run our lives from that hidden level of mind. But when the events show up that that hidden level of mind is running, he says we call it fate, like life did to us, like we have no part in it. And this body of work is, is in great harmony with what Jung presented to the world in terms of there is a work to be done. And many people don't want to go there. Many people want to avoid that work. And we are... Wholesale, full out there, inviting you to step up to the plate and 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 recognize once the process starts, I mean, it is an option, but it's not really an option to turn away. Just because things get hot doesn't mean it's time to quit or stop or interrupt or run away or what have you. That's the time to stand steady, to breathe, and do your work. Own what's going on for you. 
rather than, and you know, virtually everybody that's you know grown up in this culture by the age of four, as you've heard me say many times, and I'll say it many more times, is a card-carrying member of the one world religion to blame. The person's in a great deal of upset, and their whole conversation is about somebody else, and they have no clue that the upset that they're experiencing is a product of something moving inside of them that's going on in their own mind-body unit, in their own generational patterns. And that's the stuff that Jung is saying we have to bring to awareness. So rather than hiding it, and you know, I, I was inviting this gentleman he was a healing professional and uh, and fairly well known, fairly well respected. He's done work. He's in the past gotten great benefit. I've watched him move from states of deep anxiety and depression and intensive to just aliveness. And yet, for many people, when it comes to looking at the next level of what they need to deal with, I'm out of here. I quit. Of course, I'm only quitting because of you, not because of me. I mean, I'm okay. I'm just fine. I'm only quitting because of what you did. It's like we can call ourselves so deeply by structuring these pictures in our minds out of thought disorders, and then we believe the expression of the thought disorders when they show up as pictures in our minds. And, of course, if we're in that game of denial or our definition of denial, when I think or speak as though something outside of me is the cause of what's moving inside of me, that looks like you made me mad, you made me sad, you made me afraid. If I hold that thought disorder that somebody else outside of you could possibly cause something to happen inside of you, then your mind takes that thought disorder and makes a picture of whoever that somebody is, whoever is in your blame of. But just, just be aware that when you're the one that runs away, when you're the one who goes into a fit of rage and turns stale and runs the other way, you're dealing with a conversation in your own mind. The truth is you have no interaction with the person in the external world at all. Your mind makes it look like you do, but you're battling your own in- internal dynamics. Young has another, and I, I don't can't give you the quote liter- exactly, but... But basically what he says is every interaction with others, especially those with whom we think we're disturbed, is a place where we can learn more about ourselves. Why? Because of this thing called projection. What is projection? Is projection taking something that's inside of me and putting it outside of me? No, that's what the culture pretty much teaches, but no, that's not what it is at all. Literally, projection is the ability of the mind holding thought disorders to convert those thought disorders to pictures of whoever one is blaming at the moment. So you go back and you get somebody to do an essay on, you know, the... 75 years of their life, and they'll start out how at the age of five, Billy, you know, I was in grade kindergarten, and Billy beat me up, and it was Billy's fault, and then grade, in grade seven, and then grade nine, and grade 11, and grade 12, and, you know, in early college, I had this fight with, and it was all his fault, and, and yes, when I ran away from that conversation last week, it was their fault that I did it. Now, clearly, if you're in physical danger, move out of the way. But if you're not in physical danger, the only reason to run is because of what's going on inside of you. Ownership and forgiveness. Forgiveness is, as it was taught 2,000 years ago by this man named Yeshua, is the most powerful tool I know of. It's the only tool I know of that when used consistently and persistently, consistently and persistently, 
acquaints us with our own unconscious dynamics, gets us out of this place where we can talk about and think about and blame everybody else and we can give somebody else a sentence and think we're innocent victims. So nothing to do with me. And we'll go off and tell other people and try to convert them and convince them that, you know, my story about them is really true. <laughs> Guess who your story about them is really true about? It's projection. It's true about you. So when you own that, get a chance to move through it to the other side. So, and, and that's why our workshop, Healing Through Relationships, is called Healing Through Relationships. When I first taught that workshop 40-some years ago, it was called Healing Your Relationships because I thought there was a thing called a diseased relationship. And then as I started to really dig deeper and deeper into the work, no, there's no such thing as a diseased relationship. There are people in relationship with each other who are diseased, and if we recognize that, then it's the interaction and the relationship that will show us the part of ourselves that we're hiding from ourselves. And how does it do that? The forgiveness tool collapses the projection of the mind. The forgiveness tool isn't about letting other people off the hook. The forgiveness tool is about collapsing the projections of your mind and giving you direct that to the hidden part of your own mind. And when you're willing to do that, things resolve very, very, very quickly. But if you run away and you decide you're going to pronounce a sentence on somebody else for what they've done, and you're the one who ran away, know that you're light years away from your work still. So what forgiveness does is it collapses the constructs of the mind and gives you access to the underlying content. You know, a good image for it is, and unfortunately it's not a very uh, nice topic, but it's one that everybody knows. You know, we all watched, and you've probably seen it many, 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 many times, and the 9-11 towers go down when they were hit by an airplane. And you'll notice that those towers, at free fall speed, and this is a whole other question that we're not going to get into, at free fall speed dropped into their own footprint. Well, we know that's really not possible, but we'll, we'll just leave that conversation alone. But the important part is that when the 9-11 towers were hit, they dropped into their own footprint. And when, they were, when one is able to get in touch with the footprint that has built this tower of blame when the tower is knocked down and basically what forgiveness does collapses the projections of the mind and uncovers what's underneath it, what sourced it, what's in the footprint. So if you're in some kind of pain, disorder, disease, suffering, the first thing you want to do is understand how to get into the footprint beneath that upset. Bring that footprint, that information forward in the presence of conscious, active love. And when you do, whatever's been hidden is exposed. You remember in the ancient scriptures, he said, nothing will remain hidden. Everything will be made known in the light of day. Everything you've never dealt with is going to come up. And you're going to have to deal with it sooner or later. Most people never deal with it. They just keep taking those unconscious, underlying, unresolved dynamics in themselves, making pictures, which they paint on the inside of their eyeballs of everybody else whose fault it is, who's to blame. And then they said about using their time, intelligence, money, and energy to change somebody else. They, don't, they never suspect that, gee, I just had a disturbed state of mind in a conversation with someone, and I left the conversation in a huff because of what they were doing. 
What forgiveness does is it corrects that lie in the mind and gives one an opportunity to collapse the tower of projection. And when it collapses, it drops into its own footprint. So now you have access to the underlying unconscious information inside yourself. And that is what changes the whole game. So dramatically. The worksheet process, if you're not using it, there's several ways you can approach it. You can go to our website and download the worksheets, print them, do the worksheet live on the website. You can download the world's only forgiveness app. And to do that, you go to your app store and type in the words Heartland, H-E-A-R-T-L-A-N-D, one word, Aramaic, A-R-A-M-A-I-C, forgiveness. When you get that about halfway typed in, you'll see four or five apps come up. One of them will have a red glowing heart, a small heart. That's the app. That's the Heartland app. Install it. It's purposely, consciously designed to be extremely private. And it is extremely powerful to use. So you can do the forgiveness process right on your phone from inside the app. Or, as I say, you can download the sheets and, and print them from your, your own printer and, and do the worksheets in writing. One of the things we do suggest is you utilize at least a written form of the process, whether it's you know typing it into your computer or your phone or writing it longhand on a sheet. Because what we've found is that when one is doing worksheets in writing, there's a whole different quality of attention paid to the subtle thoughts that people would otherwise avoid and ignore. And when we're in denial, and one of those subtle thoughts is activated or resonated, then what the unconscious mind does with it is it uses that information to build one's image of the person they're wanting to blame. And recognizing that the mind is an evidential device, the only evidence you ever get to see is evidence of your own BS. That's belief system, of course. The belief that somebody else is to blame, your mind will show you. Your mind will generate an actual literal picture that it will make it look like it's all somebody else's fault. But, you know, once again, one of my favorite tongue-in-cheek lines is you'll notice if you've been through a particular painful reality 87 different times with 42 different people, you're the only one that was there every time. Your painful realities are about you. They're not about anybody else. And when you walk away from a conversation, having that, that's a conflicted conversation, and you have a conversation with yourself about yourself, you're moving in the direction of healing. But if you walk away from a conflicting situation and you're having a conversation about the other guy, then you're stuck in your projection and the perceptual mind is lying to you. If your physiology is totally and completely at peace, then you can't have a conflicting conversation with anybody. And the objective of this work is to equip you with the tools to reach a state in your life where you recognize that if you're feeling some sort of a disturbance, you're feeling a reflection of an energy that's inside of you. But you can't feel the energetic dynamics of what's happening outside of you. And so that's where this work ultimately is aiming to support you in going. And if that makes sense, we're at about the halfway point. Got about 30 minutes left, so there's lots of room for conversation. 
So if you're out there in listener land, great. Let's say hello. All righty. I think it's Miss Susan, area code 610. You are on the air. Hi. Welcome, young lady. How are you? (laughs) Pretty well. Jeannie, can you see anything? I guess you saw enough to see a hand up. (laughs) Yeah. It's uh, (laughs) a little bit challenging, but... uh, it, like I, you know, when I clicked, uh, I thought I clicked Magna's microphone on, and and apparently I didn't the first time. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, they're they're starting Diluted to get back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. Diluted. <laughs> right. Well, Michael, you're talking right at the edge of a challenge I have, and I really liked what you said to Stelinda yesterday because. She's just at the place, as I am, of being thinking I see characteristics in someone else. <clears throat> and then I'm watching my reactions, which are totally my business. But she was right. saying, couldn't it be, I think she was saying, couldn't it be that they really are doing that or they're really whatever? And yes, I think your answer, and I've asked this before, but I'm, going around the circle again. Yes, we okay. may see things. We may see things, but how are we responding if we're having any kind of upset? Then there's our homework. And, okay, so there's the first part. The second part is I have been listening to podcasts and reading about polyvagal theory, and I know you talk right. about sympathetic dominance and how we can shut down or go into fight or flight, um, et cetera, and, and there are solutions for us if we find ourselves in a state of unwellness like that. And the reason I'm calling about this right now is pointedly because my grandson, Charlie, has just left for college, having been, you know, in various places visiting friends, And he seems to be very highly functional, but when I talked to him today, I said, how how are you doing with the OCD stuff? Because he's working on it with a therapist. He said, you know, I'm in fight or flight almost all the time. I've lost 12 pounds. Bless his heart. I'm exhausted, exhausted. and I, I think I know what I'm doing, and I, I, I think I understand what I'm doing but I'm just not in a very good way. And when I go back to school, I get into that because each person presents a kind of challenge. I think I may be picking up on some kind of disapproval from somebody. Of course, now we're getting into the psychological part. But he, I thought if there were, he won't take, he's on a medication. I don't know what it is. Obviously it isn't taking care of everything. His doctors are very concerned because he's rail thin. He does work out. He's strong. and But his sleep is interrupted, and he just has this business going on. So, of course, I'm poking around in all kinds of directions. I've been using Jeannie's wonderful worksheet, the little Heartland Aramaic Forgiveness Worksheet, um, and I've done a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot. I've done four worksheets and two mind shifters, and the mind shifters are so similar that they're sort of becoming each other, and a lot of journal writing over my own thing right. with Michael. But I'm also listening to these podcasts and hoping that to tide Charlie over in some way, he could breathing exercises, cold water on the face, or taking a cold shower. He knows about that. I wouldn't in a million years take a cold shower, but he does. He does, and he says he does feel better afterward, or working out helps. But it's all these exterior things that are supposed to switch you over, but they're temporary. They seem temporary. So, well, uh, here's one of the challenges. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about activating the vagus nerve. Yeah. Vagus 
the name of the nerve is vagus, and the word means wandering because it goes all over the yeah. body. And it yeah. has to do with rest, digestion, and higher brain function, regeneration, mm-hmm. healing. Mm-hmm. And if one has been, here's where I see one of the challenges with doing all the exercises that are recommended to activate the vagus nerve, is that mm-hmm. when one is in sympathetic dominance, yeah. Basically, that's the fear, fight, flight mode. And right. what happens is that the blood is shunted away from those functions that you want related to the vagus nerve so yeah. that the muscles are ready to fight or run. Yeah. And okay. when that happens chronically, mm-hmm. then just like... You know, when the the tree falls over in the river and you don't clean it up, that beautiful, clean, clear river all of a sudden becomes a swamp. Over Mm -hmm. not too much time, the leaves and the debris coming down the river get caught in the tree branches and and all of a sudden it becomes clogged up and things start to grow there that don't belong in the river and you've got a whole full-blown swamp with all the bacteria and critters growing, literally animals showing up. And in the same way, I think that's an accurate representation of what happens in the body to all of the rivers of blood flow to those desired functions like higher brain function, regeneration, elimination, like the the back, I forget, one-third of the colon is, is driven by the vagus nerve. It's, it's fueled by the vagus nerve. And if that's cut off, then a person has bowel difficulties, has, has constipation and such. You know, there's so many things that are impacted by it. And if it's chronic, then those pathways that are supposed to supply the vagus nerve, yes, you stimulate the vagus nerve, but if there's no way for the blood to get through because it's chronically congested, then it's futile. My invitation, my suggestion would be, If the lady that you've loaned your Avacyn to would be uh, willing to do without it for a week or two, you might want to get it and get him to use it a couple of times a day and see if that gives him uh, a moment of respite physiologically. Mm. It starts to uh, increase, you know, what, what it's designed to do is to increase the microcirculation, increase the blood flow to those functions that have been cut off. And over time, I remember back, mm, it's probably two years ago, with my own hand in the Avison one day, and you know, one of the intensives we do is intuitive development, and we teach people to gather information in ways other than the five senses normally do. And I remember one day I put my hand in the Avison, and, and I was literally shown, I got a visual in my mind of a little guy with a pickaxe going into my cells and picking at, loosening up the congested wastes in the cell. And and that's the only way that the blood flow is going to be restored because for somebody who's chronic, they're just, it's like crusted up, it's locked up. And so mm-hmm. over time, there'll be a restoration of that blood flow. Now stimulate the vagus nerve, and everything to do with the vagus nerve has blood flow. But if you stimulate it without the blood flow, it's kind of futile. The long, hard way so, around. So I think I lost you at one point. So you're basically okay. saying he can do all of those things, the cold shower, the breathing, but if the blood flow isn't there, then these won't help. Is that what you said? You're not going to have the long-term impact. Yeah. You're not going to restore okay. it to normal by simply stimulating the vagus nerve. Yeah, there will be some impact of it, but you've got to supply yeah. those organs that are yeah. congested with blood flow so that they can carry through it now that they've got the, the vagus nerve sending impulses there. If the impulse is there, but there's no blood flow to carry out the impulse, then it's kind of futile. Okay, so second question. You told me once that I was lending my Avacyn because I wasn't noticing the effect, the good effects of the Avacyn, and I was using it twice a day for months, really. And I was felt free enough to lend it to somebody. And I asked you, sure. could it be that 
since I walk four to five miles a day and teach an exercise class three times a week, do you think the exercise is doing what the Addison was doing? And at Absolutely. that point, I think you said yes. And yes, Charlie that, that would does, be my take. Charlie does, he's very active and make sure mm-hmm. he gets to the gym because it helps, but it helps for a short while. And so whatever is right. needing to kick back in in his unwellness is kicking right back in. So in the same way, and he's on his way to Davidson College down in one of the Carolinas. I think I forget. Isn't that awful? I can't right. remember where he, where he is. But he, he doesn't have any Addison down there, I know. And if if exercise would do the same thing, what, how frequently and at what intensity could replicate the Avicen, he would do that, I think, if he had the time. You know, well, they, you know, they did one research project at the University of California in, Ir- no, not Irvine, University of California in San Diego with um, people who had diabetes. Mm -hmm. And the upshot of it was that they got a change in postprandial blood sugar of about 60 points by using the Mm -hmm. Avacyn for 30 minutes after a meal. And that's the roughly equivalent of about a brisk one-hour walk. Wow, that's really... So putting one's hand in the Avacyn for 30 minutes and just laying, relaxing, Mm -hmm. doing it is about the equivalent of a 30-minute brisk walk. And so consistently and persistently doing that, you know, and mm-hmm. with where the average person now being a young man, and although if he's in school, he's, he's maybe going to be too tied up and too busy with it, but if he could do that brisk walk two or three mm-hmm. times a day, he'd probably mm-hmm. see the, the things he's doing to stimulate the vagus nerve being more effective. Otherwise, if he mm-hmm. could put his hand in the Avacyn two or three times a day, he'd get that impact. He could sit and do his homework with his hand in the Avacyn and yeah, be getting the same physiological idea. impact. Yeah. So it's just well, like they work hand in hand. Uh, you know, another mm-hmm. way to do it is, is you know, you look in, uh, you read some of the research in, uh, in the Netherlands and uh, mm-hmm. those countries where they use uh, saunas all the time and mm-hmm. hot tubs. And they get a similar uh-huh. impact with a hot tub and a sauna. Uh, the, the, the health benefits are just enormous, and the re- my take is the reason is because they're doing exactly what the Avacyn's doing, and that is opening the microcirculation so that that energy flow is restored to places that otherwise have been cut off. And then the other mm-hmm. the other piece of the puzzle uh, that I would hear that it's going to be important for him to do is the part he does with his mind. What yeah. thought disorders does he need to remove so that mm-hmm. he isn't constantly setting himself in a state of sympathetic dominance? I mean, if he gets in the right. shower and gets that blood flow going, you know, cold shower, or I've got a friend that uh, he's actually got on his deck. I want to go down there. I use it. He's actually got an ice box filled with water. Huh. And mm-hmm. every morning he goes from a hot um not sauna, but um, uh, what do you call it, whirlpool type thing, into this icebox filled with water, plunge all the way down, uh, you know, right to the chin. Been there and done it with him. It's pretty interesting to do. It's, it's, after the first few times, it's actually kind of, uh, I'll use a pun, cool <laughs> to do. Huh. But, uh, you know, if, if he's constantly setting himself with thought disorders into that, sympathetic state, then he's going to, whatever you do physiologically, he's yeah. going to have to change what he's doing mm-hmm. with his mind because physiology is driven by the mind. You know, think of yourself, you know, do a meditation. Imagine that you're in this really sweet meditative state. You're cool. Everything's wonderful. You know, the colors in the room are nice. You're very relaxed. I mean, actually, I'm going to invite everybody to just join me and just imagine that you're there in that quiet, safe, sweet space. Your physiology is totally relaxed. It's nighttime, and you hear a sound that triggers 
the terror that you watched in a movie just the other night where someone broke into a house and murdered somebody. Mm-hmm. What happens to physiology? The mind is what sets physiology into sympathetic dominance. Right. And you can do everything you want physically if you don't change that then yeah. it's kind of working against itself. So that's, you know, mm-hmm. hand in hand, part of just what needs to be done. Yeah. I and, can see the and, truth and of that. if one lives in that state all the time, the challenge is, you know, it takes a higher level of understanding, moving higher into the prefrontal cortex to go, oh, this is what I need to do. And that's the part of this, the brain that's cut off from oxygen nutrition in the sympathetic sure. dominant state. Yeah. Hmm. So perhaps convincing to start to look at what he's doing with his thoughts. Oh, maybe he, give him some mind shifters to go ahead. He he is working, but not with the tools that you have. So continue, yeah, mind shifter. Right. Yeah, yeah you it might yeah. you know help them to look at what some of those thoughts are and give them a mind shift to explain how to use it. And, you know, it's a pretty simple tool to use. And just watch mm-hmm. what this resonates, what this brings up for him. Invite him to just yeah. observe that. And then, you know, start to look at, okay, so how can we repair these things with them when they trigger in you, you just shut down into that sympathetic dominant place. Mm-hmm. What can we do to change that? and maybe yeah. put him on a track of understanding it from that uh, perspective and start to work through those thought disorders. And, of course, so you know, there are a whole cadre of tools for doing that. So strange. What's that? Well, it's just strange because there's no obvious trauma that would have brought him to this state. Uh, that isn't to say there wasn't trauma, and you talk about generational trauma. Right. He certainly has, has a father who has gone into medicine, become a fantastic surgeon who just struggles with the well-being of his patients if they're not doing well. He... It's much too intense. It's not healthy. He's even thinking of retiring so, early. Go right, ahead. and my my offering would be he's never struggled with the well-being of his patients. He struggled. He's got struggle in him, and what I hear you describing is he puts that struggle in in his mind into his reality structure as being about his mm-hmm. patients but it's really about his process and what's going on inside of him. And if he resolves mm. struggle inside himself, then he'll be able to be with his patients who are at the worst end of the survival spectrum to the ones that are at the very best, and he'll just be a space of love for supporting them wherever they're at rather than getting lost in his projection that his disturbance is about the terrible possible outcomes of this patient. If he can start to recognize that that's about, you know, he has that struggle because he has that struggle, not because his patients are going through something or facing something or maybe there's a catastrophe happening. If yeah. if he didn't have a struggle and there's a catastrophe happening for a patient, he'd be able to just rush in as the active space of love and help to uplift that person. Mm. That's true. Uh, yeah, that's something I should absolutely have known since starting to study with you and Tim. <laughs> yeah. So okay. there's no should here, dear heart. It's not something you should have mm. known. It's no, something you know now. Thinking. You could yeah, you could take a little power person dynamic and you know play that out as though oh look what I should have done and failed to do and, you know, put a load on yourself, which might be the same kind of load that your son's carrying. 
or you mm. could go, oh, there's a new a new piece of information. Great, I got that now. Good. I can yeah. put that forward. Right. Now I have another question. Um, if no other hands are up, I know you stay with one person. I know you'll hear anything. <laughs> oh. Go for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have done, I go through these phases. It's almost like a, a menstrual cycle or something where I am very seriously triggered by our house guest. And I do, I had to do a serious bunch of work and Dr. Kim helped a lot with that, gave assignments, kept me on track, did. Mm -hmm. And I did some what I would call vaguely successful worksheets. Uh, they, I was not impressed. You know, when you ask at the end, was this a successful worksheet? I'd have to sit there. Was it? I'm not so sure. Uh, what are your feelings? Uh, one to ten, I'd say. You know, some, some middling number. That was consistent. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of journal writing and discovered, you know, talking about what Jung said about bringing the darkness to the light. Well, there was a heck of a lot of darkness that I was Mm -hmm. bringing out, and it's not worth any human being seeing. And then Dr. Tim said, read over that stuff. And I thought, oh, good. I'll find, I'll, I'll be asking myself, oh, how could I have written that? I have no sense of that at all. Not... I read through it, and I, I still felt pretty much the way I did when I wrote them down. All the, right. uh, the bad stuff was still very active, and I'm going to have to right. go back and write more and read more, but I'm getting along better with Michael. Well, I don't it, sounds like you're digging into, it sounds like you're digging into yeah. a new depth of your own process and your own mind, and you're not finished uh-huh. yet. But I suggest the reason when you go back and you still feel a lot of those feelings is because the thought disorders behind those feelings are still held by your mind. Yeah. And so start to isolate those thought disorders and then Mm -hmm. utilize the tools to free yourself of those thought disorders. Then you go back and you read that and you go, oh, God, I can remember when I really used to get upset about that one. Oh, I went crazy about that. Oh, when this one came up, I was just a wreck. And and you'll be able Mm -hmm. to be at peace because you freed yourself of it. I mean, every feeling, remember, is just a shadow of a thought. And if the feelings are down and dark and nasty, it's because there are down and dark and nasty thoughts that just need to be uprooted and changed. And that's the process. And and notice over the last five or so years how much of that you've done. And now yeah. you start yeah. to step in at a new depth of your own work. You remember you've heard me say many times over the years that it takes the average person who's committed to using these tools five to ten years to really get what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. So maybe Mm -hmm. it's time to go to in a new way with a new level of understanding of the reason I go back and feel those traumatic feelings when I read that is because reading that resonates thought disorders that I've not yet forgiven. And so now I'm ready to read, and when I come across one, I'm going to use every tool I've got to free myself of it. Mm. I want to take a nap. And it's about unwinding. Say that. (laughs) (laughs) I hear you. Yep. Yep. Unconsciousness (laughs) is part of the, the healing process. Let me check out. Yeah, we need to refurbish the the army. <laughs> yeah. Feed them a good lunch, and then we'll tackle it again. Mm-hmm. So notice when you're reading them, what yeah. thoughts you have that you don't normally pay attention to. Those thoughts down. 
you know, kind of like you would with a mind shifter. And so what do I need to do to clean this one up? What do I need to do to free myself from this belief, this thought that I'm trying to help my grandson resolve? And when you resolve it, you'll be empowered on a whole other level to support him in resolving what he's carrying that's, you know, been passed on to uh, to all the boys. Well, the, the intuitive hit that comes, you yeah. might take a look at some of that and call Luke. And ask me if he'll support you in a worksheet or two. Oh, wow. And that he might just, uh, that's, that's just the hit I get, that he might just be, with the work that he's doing and done, be intuitively available to support Grandma after all the support she's given him to move not only her, you, but the whole family system past those layers. Mm. That's a lovely idea. Too bad he just started school again. But I can still call him. I don't know how busy he is. But, you know, he's in his seventh year of college. He really? Dropped out, resumed, changed schools, you know, been out of commission, been to rehab twice, finally on track to graduate but sometime. He's, he's rocking. This year, <laughs> what's he studying? He's he's a writer actually. He's studying English, and he has been he's he's been writing and running AA groups too, but writing uh, short stories. And he thinks now he'd like to be a an English professor, and so he may go right into graduate school. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Well, I get the sense that he'd be delighted to make some time. You know, the fact that you gave him time that he's acknowledged more than once really helped him turn around with doing the forgiveness process, that he'd be delighted to find some space to, to well, just hold the nice space idea. for you. That's a great idea. Yeah. And it would be a powerful acknowledgement of him, too, of what he's done. You know, when you think of the the tragedy of his process, which it, it was for quite some time, and that he's lifted himself up out of it, that would be a powerful mm-hmm. acknowledgement. Yeah. And we could all use that at, at some point or another. Yeah, speak for yourself, Michael, and you deserve Every one of us, <laughs> right? Every one yeah. of us. Yeah. <clears throat> so... Well, that's very helpful. Yeah, and with Charlie and the Addison, um, I'll tell him about this machine, and, and I, I could get it and send it down. My my friend has certainly had a wonderful long run with it. Right. Quite, this leads me to yet another question. Quick question, I hope. Um. I notice my balance isn't as good as it used to be, and I do, with my students, I practice balancing. Um, And my friend who has the Addison is three years or so older than I am and says her balance is so terrible she uses a walker. Well, I'm not there yet, Mm -hmm. but I was wondering if you have any knowledge about shoring up losing your balance more as you get older. Well, that's interesting. I've actually just registered for a uh, weekend workshop uh, with a actually a Ukrainian medical doctor who does a thing called medical massage. And one of mm-hmm. the topics that they're going into, and I'm I'm basically going to study with this man because he's a master. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing a practice where I'm putting my hands on people and such. And this is a hands-on workshop. But I'm mainly going to just be in a master space 
Uh, mm. But I'll let you know what I learned because one of the topics that's being covered, and this is at the end of the month of, uh, in this particular workshop, is balance. Mm. I'd be interested. Yeah. So I'll report what I find. Okay. Have you noticed that for yourself? Balance? Mm-hmm. Um, or Jeannie, she's younger, I think. But Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I think that if I look over the long haul of my life, there's always been a certain off-balance kind of thing. You know, as a kid, I was always spraining my ankles and twisting my foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I've, I see changes there. It's it's a little hard you'd to assess. Know, you, but... Yeah, you'd be saying an absolute yes right away if you knew it. It's a very strange thing. I'll, I'll stand up, and suddenly I'm a little bit going sideways. And I've seen old people do that. And I, I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. Not yet. My mom lost her balance totally in her 90s. She just Ouch. had to be carried around practically. Yeah. So, and it got to a point where the doctor tried to work with her therapist and said he really couldn't get anywhere. It's too far gone. But the thought was, I, I think I imagined him saying that if you had caught this earlier, you could correct it. And I do, as I say, work with my students. We always do a little five minutes of balancing on one foot with your eyes shut. And I count to 20 and see if we can stay upright. And I can do that. Some days are better than others, and one side is better than the other. But I don't know whether that would take care of it. You know, just keep doing that. Anyway, I'd love to know what your master says at the end of it. Well, I'll definitely uh, let you know if I learn anything of importance there. And, and uh, you know, I'd assume there are probably practitioners up in your area. They're doing, it's a specialized form called medical massage. And it's oh, it's different. Okay. There's a practitioner. The way I got in touch with there's a practitioner here in Bristol who is a massage therapist. And I've worked with massage therapists on four continents, literally, over the years with the travel I've done and such. And I've never met anybody uh -huh. that knows how to work with uh, the structure the way she does. I, I've never met anybody. Okay. And I've met What's some the really again? wonderful medical massage. Medical massage, okay. Yeah. So okay. I'll keep you posted well, thanks, on that. Michael. Great. All right, dear heart. Well, it's telling me in my ear that our time is up. So yes. I'm right. questions and thoughts. It's open a nice space, and uh, and we hold the space for for your son, for your grandsons, and uh, for you to have the best year yet of your eternal life.